a Wikivide Documentaries production. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Enjoy. Symbionese Liberation Army The United Federated Forces of the Symbionese Liberation Army was an American left-wing revolutionary and domestic terrorist organization active between 1973 and 1975 that considered itself a vanguard army. The group committed bank robberies, two murders, and other acts of violence. The SLA became internationally notorious for the kidnapping of heiress Patty Hearst, abducting the 19-year-old from Berkeley, California. Interest increased when Hearst, in audio-taped messages delivered to regional news media, announced that she had joined the SLA. Hearst later said that members of the terrorist group threatened to kill her, held her in close confinement, and sexually assaulted and brainwashed her. As of 2017, all but one of the surviving SLA members have been released from prison. Symbionese Concept In his manifesto, Symbionese Liberation Army Declaration of Revolutionary War and the Symbionese Program, Donald DeFries wrote, The name Symbionese is taken from the word symbiosis and we define its meaning as a body of dissimilar bodies and organisms living in deep and loving harmony and partnership in the best interest of all within the body. This political symbiosis to freeze describes means the unity of all left-wing struggles, feminist, anti-racist, anti-capitalist, and others. De Freeze wanted all races, genders, and ages to fight together in a left-wing united front, and to live together peacefully. Seven-Headed Cobra De Freeze was the SLA's only black member. His seven-headed SLA hydra-like cobra symbol was based on the seven principles of Kwanzaa, with each head representing a principle. The Swahili words for these seven principles are, Umoja, Kuji Kagulia, Ujama, Ujama, Nia, Kumba, and Imani. The appearance of the symbol of the seven-headed cobra on SLA propaganda indicates that it was copied from the ancient Sri Lankan an Indian seven-headed naga. Carved stones depicting a seven-headed cobra are commonly found near the sluices of the ancient irrigation tanks in Sri Lanka and are believed to have been placed there as guardians of the water. The particular graphic of the seven-headed cobra used by the SLA may have been copied from an illustration in The Lost Continent of Mew by James Churchwood. Prison Visits and Political Film the SLA formed as a result of the prison visitation programs of the radical left-wing group Venza Remos Organization, and a group known as the Black Cultural Association in Soldad Prison. The idea of a South American-styled urban guerrilla movement, similar to the Tupam Rose movement in Uruguay, combined with Registi Bray's theory of urban warfare and ideas drawn from Maoism, appealed to a number of people, including Patricia Michelle Soltazik. De Freeze Escapes Prison The SLA formed after the escape from prison by Donald De Freeze, alias, General Field Marshal Chinqua. He had been serving five years to life, for robbing a prostitute. De Freeze took the name Chinqua from the leader of the slave rebellion who took over the slave ship Amistad in 1839. De Freeze escaped from Soldad State Prison on March 5, 1973 by walking away while on work duty in a boiler room located outside the perimeter fence. De Freeze has been accused by some sources of being an informant from 1967 to 1969 for the Public Disorder Intelligence Unit of the Los Angeles Police Department. De Freeze had been active in the Black Cultural Association while at the California Medical Facility, a state prison facility in Vacaville, California, where he had made contacts with members of Vence Ramos. He sought refuge among these contacts, and ended up at a commune known as Peking House in the San Francisco Bay Area. Venza Ramos associates and future SLA members Willie Wolf and Russell Little, concerned with the potential for surveillance at the high-profile Peking House to uncover De Freeze, arranged for De Freeze to move in with their associate Patricia Michelle Soltazik in the relative anonymity of Concord, California. De Freeze and Salter Zeke became lovers and began to outline the plans for founding the Symbionese Nation. Murder of Marcus Foster On November 6, 1973, in Oakland, California, two members of the SLA killed school superintendent Marcus Foster and badly wounded his deputy, Robert Blackburn, as the two men left an Oakland school board meeting. 
The hollow point bullets used to kill Foster had been packed with cyanide. The SLA had condemned Foster for his plan to introduce identification cards into Oakland schools, calling him fascist. In fact, Foster had opposed the use of identification cards in his schools, and his plan was a watered-down version of other similar proposals. On January 10, 1974, Joseph Remiro and Russell Little were arrested and charged with Foster's murder, and initially both men were convicted of murder. Both men received sentences of life imprisonment. Seven years later, on June 5, 1981, Little's conviction was overturned by the California Court of Appeal, and he was later acquitted in a retrial in Monterey County. Romero remains incarcerated in San Quentin State Prison serving his life sentence. Little has stated, who actually pulled the trigger that killed Foster was Ms. Moon. Nancy, Link Perry, was supposed to shoot Blackburn. She kind of botched that, and DeFries ended up shooting him with a shotgun. Kidnapping of Patty Hearst in response to the arrests of Remiro and Little, the SLA began planning their next action, the kidnapping of an important figure, to negotiate the release of their imprisoned members. Documents found by the U.S. Federal Bureau of Investigation at one abandoned safe house revealed that an action was planned for the full moon of January 17. The FBI did not take any precautions, and the SLA did not act until a month later. On February 4, 1974, Publishing heiress Patty Hearst, a sophomore at the University of California, at Berkeley, was kidnapped from her Berkeley residence at apartment 4, 2603 Benvenue Avenue. The kidnapping occurred less than three months after a November 1973 San Francisco Chronicle story in the Society section announcing the Hearst Stephen Weed betrothal. The SLA had chosen to kidnap Hearst to increase the news coverage of the incident. The SLA issued an ultimatum to the Hearst family, that they would release Patty in exchange for the freedom of Ramiro and Little. When such an arrangement proved impossible, the SLA demanded a ransom, in the form of a food distribution program. The value of food to be distributed fluctuated, on February 23 the demand was, for $4 million. It peaked at $400 million. Although free food was distributed, the operation was halted when violence erupted at one of the four distribution points. This happened because the crowds were much greater than expected, and people were injured as panicked workers threw boxes of food off moving trucks into the crowd. After the SLA demanded that a community coalition called the Western Edition Project Area Committee be put in charge of the food distribution, 100,000 bags of groceries were handed out at 16 locations across four counties between February 26 and the end of March. Conditions of the Initial Captivity of Patty Hearst The FBI was conducting an unsuccessful search, and the SLA took refuge in a number of safe houses. While in the SLA's custody, Hearst later claimed she was subjected to a series of ordeals that her mother would later describe as brainwashing. The change in Hearst's politics has been attributed to Stockholm Syndrome, a psychological response in which a hostage exhibits apparent loyalty to the abductor. Hearst was later examined by specialist psychologist Margaret Singer, who came to the same conclusion. Terence Hallinan, the first attorney who represented her, was planning to argue involuntary intoxication, a side effect of which is amnesia. Hearst's attorney F. Lee Bailey used the Stockholm Syndrome argument as part of the defense at trial. During Hearst's subsequent trial, her lawyer claimed that she had been confined in a closet barely large enough for her to lie down in that her contact with the outside world was regulated by her captors, and that she was regularly threatened with execution. Hearst's lawyer contended that she had been raped by DeFries and Wolfe. Both died before Hearst's capture and trial. The SLA claimed to be holding Hearst according to the conditions of the Geneva Conventions. Political Inculcation The SLA subjected Hearst to indoctrination in SLA ideology. In Hearst's taped recordings, used to announce demands and conditions, Hearst can first be heard extemporaneously expressing SLA ideology on day 13 of her capture. With each successive tape communique, Hearst voiced increasing support for the aims of the SLA. She eventually denounced her former life, her parents, and fiancé. At that point, she claimed that when the SLA had ostensibly given her the option of being released or joining the SLA, 
she had believed she would be killed if she turned them down. She began using the nom de guerre, Tanya, after Che Guevara's associate, Tanya the Gorilla. Hibernia Bank Robbery The next action taken by the SLA was to rob a branch of the Hibernia Bank at 1450 Noriega Street in San Francisco. During this incident, two civilians were shot. At 10 a.m. on April 15, 1974, SLA members burst into the bank. Hearst participated in the robbery, holding a rifle, and the security camera footage of Hearst became an iconic image. She has denied willing involvement in the robbery in her book. Every secret thing. The group was able to get away with over $10,000. Move to Los Angeles and police shootout. The SLA believed that its future depended on its ability to acquire new members and realized that, because of the killing of Marcus Foster, few if any people in the Bay Area underground wished to join them. Chinqua suggested moving the organization to his former neighborhood in Los Angeles, where he had friends whom they might recruit. However, they relocated in a sloppy manner and had much difficulty in becoming established on their new turf. The SLA relied on commandeering housing and supplies in Los Angeles, and thus alienated the people who were ensuring their secrecy and protection. At this stage, the imprisoned SLA member Russell Little said that he believed the SLA had entirely lost sight of its goals and had entered into a confrontation with the police rather than a political dialogue with the public. On May 16, 1974, Taco and Yolanda entered Mel's sporting goods store in the Los Angeles suburb of Inglewood, California to shop for supplies. While Yolanda made the purchases, Taco on a whim decided to shoplift a bandolier. When a security guard confronted him, Taco brandished a revolver. The guard knocked the gun out of his hand and placed a handcuff on William's left wrist. Hearst, on armed lookout, from the group's van across the street, began shooting up the store's overhead sign. Everyone in the store, but the Harrises took cover, and the Harrises fled the store and drove off with Hearst. As a result of the SLA's botched shoplifting incident, the police acquired the address of the safe house from a parking ticket in the glove box of the van, which had been abandoned. The rest of the SLA fled the safe house when they saw the events on the news. The SLA took over a house occupied by Christine Johnson and Minnie Lewison. One of the people in the house at the time was a then 17-year-old neighbor named Brenda Daniels, who was sleeping on the couch. Daniels recalls the events that day. The next day, an anonymous phone call to the Los Angeles Police Department stated that several heavily armed people were staying at the caller's daughter's house. That afternoon, more than 400 LAPD officers, under the command of Captain Mervyn King, along with the FBI, California Highway Patrol, and Los Angeles fire department surrounded the neighborhood. The leader of a SWAT team used a bullhorn to announce, occupants of 1466 East 54th Street, this is the Los Angeles Police Department speaking. Come out with your hands up, a young child walked out, along with an older man. The man stated that no one else was in the house, but the child intervened stating that several people were in the house, with guns and ammo belts. After several more attempts to get anyone else to leave the house, a member of the SWAT team fired tear gas projectiles into the house. This was answered by heavy bursts of automatic gunfire, and a violent gun battle began. The police were firing semi-automatic AR-15 and AR-180 rifles. The SLA members were armed with M1 carbines, which had been converted to fully automatic fire. Police also reported that the SLA had created homemade grenades from 35mm film canisters, and had thrown them at responding officers. During the shootout, police continued to fire dozens of tear gas grenades into the home, trying to flush out the SLA members. About two hours into the shootout, the house caught fire, probably due to an exploding tear gas canister, as the house began to burn. Two women left from the rear of the house and one came out the front. All were taken into custody, but were found not to be SLA members. Automatic weapons fire continued from the house. At this point, Nancy Ling Perry and Camilla Hall came out of the house. Investigators working for their parents would claim that they walked out intending to surrender and that they were unarmed, but police later stated that Hall was shot in the head by police as she aimed a weapon towards them while Perry was providing covering fire. After Hall's body fell to the ground, it was pulled back inside the burning house by Angela Atwood. Perry followed Hall out of the house. 
firing a pistol at officers as she emerged, and was shot twice. Her body remained outside the house. The rest died inside, from smoke inhalation, burns and gunshot wounds. The coroner's report concluded that Donald DeFries committed suicide by shooting himself in the side of the head. After the shooting stopped and the fire was extinguished, 19 firearms, including rifles, pistols, and shotguns, were recovered. Thousands of rounds had been fired out of the house by the SLA and police in response had fired several thousands of rounds into the house. This remains one of the largest police shootouts in U.S. history with a reported total of over 9,000 rounds being fired. Every round fired by SLA members at the police missed the officers. There were no casualties among law enforcement. The SLA dead were Nancy Ling Perry, Angela Atwood, Camilla Hall, Willie Wolfe, The Voices of Guns, page 286, Donald DeFries, and Patricia Soltizik. All but one of the bodies were found huddled in a crawl space under the house, which had burned down around them. New broadcasting technology had recently been acquired by area TV stations, so Hearst and the Harrises were able to watch the televised siege live from their hotel room in Anaheim. Police allegedly consulted psychics in searching for Hearst. Brought to you by Wikivideo Documentaries Would you like to know more?